I'm Chris, or Christoph, but Chris is just shorter, so let's keep it this way. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we used uh, in Estonian Fiber, where I worked before, and also in my own company, uh, Yellow Arrow, um, <clears throat> how we use QGIS in uh, fiber planning. So not exactly like really the network planning per se, this is like happening in a little bit different uh, software, but we used it as a tool to generate a lot of outputs because uh, you need to go to authorities to get approval for your network planning. So this was all happening uh, between uh, cooperation basically between my company and Estonian Fiber where I was also working. Um, so Estonian Fiber is planning mainly um, fiber optic networks in, in Germany, or to be more precise, in Saxony. Um, this happens, or this came to happen because of uh, the uh, cooperations we had with a company based in Leipzig and also in Chemnitz. And from my side, um, <clears throat> I'm offering basically geospatial solutions and uh, expertise to support them in their, in their doings. So I think everyone has like a internet connection at home, like fiber cable probably. This is just the, the future where to go. So you see like single fibers and they are like in, in, uh, yeah, in, in cables and these cables are in ducts and basically the entire network is built on that. So like from a really small fiber which is basically as thick as your hair and this is where your internet comes from technically. So, as an example, I, I brought uh, one project that I was still working on. Uh, it was located near Dresden in, in Saxony. And we have here like a network of a local municipality who wanted to establish uh, an optical fiber network because there has not been anything conducted in that sense. So, telecommunication in a form of copper cables were already in place, but no optical fiber cable. So what we can see here is basically um, the overview of the network. We have uh, like a trench network where the cables and the ducts are uh, located in. And uh, like the points that we see, these are basically distribution points from where the fibers go into each single house. So looking a bit more into detail, this is how it looks like on a slightly like, yeah, bigger scale. So we're already like in the town and we can see like how the cables and, and ducts basically run through the streets. And we can also see, for example, like what kind of um, ducts we have like in the, in the trench to put. So this looks already quite fancy. I mean, nice map, and, um, but you also have to keep in mind that a lot of input feeds into this planning process. So you're not only dealing with uh, the network that is generated based on a, on a street network, which can be used from, from OpenStreetMap, for example, but uh, you also have to take into account like um, nature protected areas, especially if you're outside of um, rural uh, urban areas. Um, you have to take into account that you have water networks, so you're crossing water uh, bodies. Um, since we are like <clears throat> close to some cities, we might have unexploded ordnance, so there might be areas that you also need to consider. And of course, um, not, to, not to forget the uh, other infrastructure that is in the ground. So all of these things you have to request, you have to put it into your system, and then you have to uh, analyze your network that was automatically uh, generated, but you still have to do a lot of like manual adjustments. This is just something that cannot automate it that much because you don't know all of these factors in advance yet. Certain areas you can technically avoid already, but um, like the real planning, like the network that we see here, this is already a lot of like manual adjustment uh, that, that happened during that process. So doing this process, uh, making all these plannings and moving the trenches around to make this whole network like logical and working, so this is quite an iteration of different stages. So you have to go back to authorities, ask for feedback, and you basically you are in like a loop uh, to improve the network. Uh, but once you go a little bit further in the planning and you need to um, go into the execution, you end there, bureaucracy. So you have to generate a lot of outputs, you have to fill out a lot of forms, 
Um, and yeah, unfortunately, most of the uh, authorities, they are very much uh, have a big love for paper maps, so you still are obligated to generate also output that they can use. But overall, the actually uh, driving force to revolutionize a little bit the processes that we had was um, that we just needed uh, for bigger project areas generate output in, yeah, in, in bigger forms or in, in bigger volumes, basically. So what we had uh, already in place, uh, it worked, but it was actually really slow and the performance was not very good and static. So we had a lot of like um, templates already in place, but you already had to uh, adjust basically every single page and this does not really make sense if you have like a really big uh, project area. So, and um, <clears throat> to give like an ex uh, extreme example, like um, you wanted to have like a bit of a form and uh, some situation uh, to show. Sometimes we just did that, cheap and dirty, so you had an Excel document and you make a screenshot of your QGIS and uh, yeah, you just put it in as a picture. We have had actually forms that were looking exactly like this and uh, this is a very tedious work to go through that because you go back to Q QGIS if you need to change something, you make a new screenshot, then you go back to Excel, and it just doesn't make sense. If it's like just 10 of these forms, you can do it, but if you do it for a large project area and you have like hundreds of things, then it's just not feasible and uh, wise to keep on doing it that way. So what we actually want to, to, to achieve is you click one button, and you generate an output with dozens of pages at once. Or maps. <clears throat> so we have like here maps for different purposes, like showing like high water risk areas where the network is located, which is by the way for the network, for the cables itself, like high water is not the big deal because the cables are underground, but if you put like a distribution point, the cabinets in a high water risk area, that might just swim away when the flood is coming. So, how did we get there where we ended up? So, talking a little bit about the architecture, because what you need to understand first is how can you establish new workflows, um, uh, but you need to know like your, your situation before that. So, the, net, uh, the network is calculated in, uh, in AutoCAD Map3D, and this has like a lot of plugins, um, uh, which are called NET. Uh, they are developed by a company in, in Chemnitz. And they are really powerful tools, so they can calculate really detailed networks and you can basically track a fiber from your home to the distribution point where it comes from. So you can display the entire distance and uh, calculate lengths and yeah, do a lot of fancy stuff with that. Um, so the architecture that we were um, working with was we have like a PostgreSQL database in the background and we have like um, on this side, basically the software that we do like the network adjustments with, um, but we also needed to have like an environment where we can uh, generate inputs by going out with a tablet, collecting data, and also like um, talk with the with the client and show like uh, what is actually happening without always producing a lot of maps and like going through this process over and over. Um, so we had the geo server sitting in the middle, and basically this was the connecting point to gain access via QGIS and basically it allowed us to simultaneously work in the AutoCAD environment but also in QGIS without like duplicating any data because we're accessing still the same database and we could build up our processes on that. Oops. So as I said, like this stuff was like uh, developed by uh, TKI in, in Chemnitz and they have different tools, like one tool is net engineering, which is then really like for the execution planning, but they also have like a different stage where you are in the initial design. And yeah, so this is like a normal AutoCAD environment, but you see up here that there are some different uh, plugins basically already in place. So when we did all of these things, then uh, we definitely wanted to achieve that we have the flexibility to work like in, in both um, environments, AutoCAD or QGIS. So we had to ensure that this is like, um, yeah, accessible from both sides. 
what we also noticed when we moved some of the processes to QGIS that uh, some things work just a lot faster. Like if it comes to like geo-referencing uh, PDFs, especially when you have infrastructure data and you need to digitize it, this went a lot faster in, in QGIS than in AutoCAD. And then also like the actual uh, network adjustments uh, were also like a lot smoother in, in that sense. And then of course, if you go to this uh, permission process, then uh, you just need like really quick produce, like a lot of output. Um, the initial idea was always like to not replace something. We more wanted to give the possibility if someone feels more comfortable doing like these kind of things like trench amendments in AutoCAD, this is still possible and it's still happening, but uh, other people were more like, uh, or having a preference for QGIS and they could do it in the same way, basically. So no collision, no conflict, so everything was actually working out smoothly. And of course, learning. So if you establish like new workflows, if you want to develop them further, then I cannot emphasize that this is something that you have to really go through. And so let me put it this way. Um, it always started like with a question like, why are we doing this? Like, why are we doing these steps like this over and over and over again? Uh, without questioning um, the, the overall process. So, and then if you ask around, and I guess everyone has heard probably that answer, yeah, we have always done it that way. And yeah, you just go along with that. But that was not really my approach. <laughs> so I, I always started to um, question like these things that we had. But if you do, um, yeah, you have to fight. So, um, because this will cost a lot of like time, your time, to really develop yourself, uh, learning these things. Uh, you have to understand the, the structure, the network architecture, and all of these things before you can actually really uh, establish like these uh, solutions that you that you want to. And then, of course, you have to convince people, you have to convince your supervisors, you have to convince the management, and uh, yeah, sometimes you get rejected, but uh, what do you do? You do it anyway, and just see what happens, and like, thank me later, kind of. Because if you really want to move forward, this is the way. <laughs> so, to give you like a better example, like what we were actually doing uh, in like one particular case, and I mentioned it earlier, is uh, water crossings. So whenever your network crosses a water body, you need a, a permission for that particular location. So again, if you have like just 10 to 20, you can do it like the old fashioned way, make your Excel form and put a screenshot in. But uh, as we saw earlier, we have quite a large network and you have hundreds of these crossings. So th then it's just not feasible to do it like this anymore. So again, you have like different inputs that you have to consider. Um, there's on one side, there's your network, then you also have like external data sources like uh, water network, uh, which you can retrieve from Saxony uh, free of charge. So this data is open data and it's uh, accessible. Um, then you also have like data collected on uh, field trips uh, through the web application. So you have like pictures, you have measurements and so on, and all of this needs to be basically uh, turned into one layer or one data set that can be used later on to uh, generate the output. And of course, uh, you don't want to do this like over and over again, so you try to simplify your life and uh, also the, the life of your colleagues if they need to do it themselves. So you start developing models, basically. And yeah. So I'm really grateful for a graphical modeler or, yeah, model builder or model model designer yeah uh, in QGIS I'm not a really strong programmer but I really love this that I can do it like visually with Lego pieces and put them together and connect them and uh, still generate my output so without like taking this geo process then doing this and doing this and doing this and you just like keep on going and you have to do it like every time again but you can save these models and integrate them uh, in your project right away and then you can like reuse them. Like if you have a new project area, you just identify the input uh, or the parameters that you need and you click one button and you have basically your 
your layer. So basically what we have done is um, we have this layout and we had this layout already previously in AutoCAD. Um, but I can already tell you that this was a lot of like handiwork. So every drawing was like individual. So when you have multiple crossings, you went, uh, you just made another sheet, you made copy paste and you changed a little bit some things and all these parameters and measurements and so on. This was so much manual work. Again, it's just not really sustainable to do it like always like this in, in the same manner. And you can already see like, uh, yeah, multiple tabs basically. Insane, so <laughs> to say the least. So basically what the approach was, okay, these crossings, they always follow a certain scheme and the situations are quite similar. So we take all of that, throw out all the, the other crap and just keep the drawings uh, blank and have them as templates. And of course, um, if you want to do this and uh, you also want someone else to pick up your work and continue it, uh, you have to document it. So how we did the documentation was uh, basically describing every element and how it's linked to the database, where the data is uh, retrieved from. So I tried to make it really interactive. You just click on these elements and you know like which settings you have to do, for example. Yeah, with a lot of screenshots, so these are just a few slides where I basically explained what every element uh, in the layout view is, is doing and how it works. But let's try to show this a little bit in real life. Oh, I need to change this. Okay. see my screen. You have duplicated, uh, extended again. This is now in the system, so we have our, yeah, our layer structure and we have our network, uh, which is here a little bit simplified because for the authorities, they don't need to know like which exactly trench type or construction type is needed, so they only need to see the location for the, for the actual crossings. So if we look here into this area, all these blue dots are water crossings, so where the trench crosses the network. So you can already imagine that would be a lot of work to do that like piece by piece. So basically what we did is um, we used uh, in the layout, basically we generated an atlas. And what we did was basically uh, the basic functionality that you have is you pick a layer which is identifying your atlas feature and then it's generating a, a series of maps. So in this uh, sub area, for example, we have like 20, 26 crossings, but of course the overall project area is bigger, but subdivision. And um, we have all these different elements in here. So for example, here we have the actual drawing, which is like a SVG file, uh, which is named after an ID, like a crossing ID sitting in the background. Uh, it's retrieved via the um, file name and yeah, so depending on which crossing type it is, it picks the file and displays it. So, I'll show you. So, if we go through, 
uh, these things change. The map sometimes takes a bit longer. And you can also see that down here the, um, the coordinates, for example, are changing. And yeah, so it's really dynamic. Um, it can be re re reproduced for four different project areas and all the steps basically are properly documented so for someone really to pick up the work and understand what's, what is actually going on. So we have a lot of values in here that are retrieved from attribute tables. These attribute tables are enriched uh, via relations, via joins, so we can retrieve all of this information and display it in yeah, different places all over the layout. So yeah, my name is Chris. Um, that was a short introduction and in how we utilize the system. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can write me an email, find me on LinkedIn, and I think we have time for some questions. <laughs> Easy ones, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I think it was a really nice example to make uh, in-depth use of, of QGIS functionality. Um, that was really nice. Uh, questions? You are using, thank you very much for the talk. You are using several data sources, probably with different accuracies, different reference systems. The coordinates, can be a problem because you, you, you cannot make a whole one meter, two meters apart. There's a different place in the street. Was that a real problem? The accuracy of the coordinates of the input you were using. Okay. So for, for this purpose, um, they need to know roughly where the location is, where it's crossing, but uh, it's not only the coordinates that they need. Depending on how good they are, uh, sometimes if they live with paper maps, they are not looking up the coordinates. They want to know which parcel in which subdivision of that region uh, is the crossing located. So we give the coordinates because uh, some authorities want to have it, but actually they are fine if you give like the parcel information, like where the crossing is located. So. Yeah, hello, <clears throat> hello. Thank you for the presentation, Chris. It was interesting that you resolve the um, uh, problem to work with, with uh, AutoCAD users. But I have a question from similar uh, fiber optics uh, problem, but not the same. Have you deal with or heard about solutions based on QGIS on maybe some other open source uh, tools that address the management of optical fiber splitting, splicing, sorry. So, when these uh, cables must split to uh, all the, um, from the main cable to the single houses, and you must know the to topological of the uh, cables that this is a uh, level one deeper, and we are from uh, Enviro Solutions on Poland, and we're looking for uh, solutions of that problem. Did you hear something about that? Thank you. Ooh, tough one. Uh, so, I mean, I have worked with the net software uh, myself as well, but um, it is capable of like tracing back not only the fiber, it also like shows you where the ducts and so on are split. You have a bundle, one uh, duct uh, splits out, and you can see all of that. You can see it like uh, in the table version, you can see it in the, uh, in the map view. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> I have a question. I think this is very interesting use case of QGIS to manage plan utilities infrastructure. Just I have a question. How do you manage and share QGIS project file across organizations? Do you upload somewhere QGIS project file and the stuff download or maybe putting somewhere in file server? to share master file or something? Good question. Um, we were working with SharePoint and uh, the QGIS files were stored on, on SharePoint folders. Um, so 
of course, like if someone accesses the same data with a database, it's not a, not an issue. But if you have other local data, then it generates copies accidentally. So we try to put everything into the database, basically. Um, if you want to use this functionality as we did, then um, uh, what, what you need to what you need to achieve is that uh, you work with internal variables in the QGIS, like where is the project folder? Because if you don't do this, and you have, uh, for example, these SVG drawings, uh, and you put only your path in it, your path does not work for your colleague. So you have to have this dynamic path uh, in mind that you don't run into problems. Okay. Then are there any more questions? People are hungry for lunch, maybe. Then give another round of applause for Christoph.